Hey YouTube, JB Dillon. Today we're going to take a look at a Velodyne F1200B. This is a popular powered subwoofer that was sold about 20 years ago, around 1994. And the foam always rots around the edge, and somebody's refoamed this woofer already. But uh, this one's got the infamous low frequency oscillation problem, which basically caused the excursion to get bigger and bigger and bigger until it slams the woofer on the back of the magnet cabinet. Uh, it's due to a failure of the servo circuit uh, which unfortunately may or may not be fixed but we're gonna find that out today. This thing is really easy to take apart. Uh, from the back here you just remove the panel there's six screws and then it unplugs and this is on an extension so you can just kind of you know pull it out a little bit and then disconnect it from the board. So I've got the board out and I'm ready to repopulate the capacitors. I'll show which ones commonly fail and hopefully if the accelerometer is not bad that will fix it. So let's uh, go to the board. So here's the module when you pull it out. And it was a pretty nice thing in its day. It's got a uh, adjustable crossover. Uh, it uses both speaker level and line level inputs. It was very popular at the time. Um, Velodyne used what they call a servo system, which is long and short of it, they incorporated a accelerometer into the feedback circuit of the amplifier and the accelerometer was mounted inside the woofer. And the feedback that it gave the amplifier uh, kind of told the amplifier how far the woofer had moved and whether it needed to back off or give it a little more kick. And so that way you could get a pretty decent our base response out of an amplifier that was maybe only 50 watts, which is really what this is. This is just using an STK 4040 Mark II uh, running uh, in bridged mode. So it's about maybe a, a 50 to 60 watt amplifier into 8 ohms, about 80 into 4. So it's not terribly much, but the servo helps. Uh, but anyways, uh, the things that die, uh, if we look down on the board here, um, C16, C17, C6, and C7, which are these guys down here that I've already pulled, those are 220 microfarad. They're almost always dead. Almost always. I've never seen one yet that had a good one. Most of them are just some variant of tired or just flat out open. And that's uh, part of your power that fires the uh, op amps controlling the servo circuit here in the crossover. Now the second ones that die, uh, there's two 4.7 microfarads here and here which I pulled, that's C4 and C8 on the 55-112B board, uh, that's your servo circuit, and then there's more uh, on uh, your crossover circuit which are 33 microfarad here and here, which were also open. Now. I don't know if that's going to fix it. Sometimes it does if the accelerometer is good. If the accelerometer is bad, it's very hard to wire around the accelerometer for a fixed feedback uh, successfully without clipping the hell out of the amplifier. And I know of no one that sells the accelerometers to replace inside the woofer. And it's a bit of a chore to do so even if you do have them. So. I'm going to go ahead and pull the parts and we're going to install them and then we're going to install the amp module and test it to see if it oscillates and if it doesn't, awesome. If it does, well, we're back to the problem of the accelerometer being bad. So let's go ahead and get cracking on that. Try to get some good shots here so you can kind of see uh, replacing these things. They use these double sided solder pads which are kind of terrible. I don't really much care for them, but they do exist, and I have to deal with it. So, here it's best to use some solder wick. We're going to go ahead and flip the board, and we're going to do the ones on the bottom first. These 220 microfarad. The problem with these boards is, is that you have to have a hot iron, you have to be fast. Otherwise, you'll likely pull up the foil trace with it. These are also double-sided boards, 
So if you do rip up the foil trays, then you have the problem of, well, how do I reconnect the board again? And oftentimes you'll have to hardwire it or uh, leave enough of the lead out that you can trace and attach it to uh, its original point. Never been a fan of double-sided boards, but that's just me. Now again, I give no guarantee that this will fix your problem. But uh, it may. Now, thankfully everything's marked on the board. I don't know if you can see there, but you do have plus and minus, so you do have an idea of how to insert them. Now let's say you get one that's a little bit stubborn like this, that doesn't want to go through. There's still some solder in that solder pad. You can heat the lead at the entry point, and it will likely break that little bit of crusty solder and get in there. See if I have to do that for the other one. Very likely I do. Yep, both of them are cranky. This is why I don't like double-sided boards. This one's going to fight me. Alright, so I've got it partially in, but it doesn't want to go all the way in. So I'm going to grab the leads from the underside. Just kind of pull that through there. Alright, so let's get another one in here. Love to play music or something except for the fact that the copyright Nazis will get me. So I apologize for silence. I'm sure you guys don't want to hear me battle all day either. That one's going to be really stubborn. So what I'm going to have to try to do here is get some solder wick in there into that little spot and see if I can wick up the solder on the solder pad. Can I just make that worse? Uh, that's why I don't like these boards. Yeah, that one's just going to be a pain. Let's try this again. You too can enjoy the frustration of not being able to do this by trying to fix your own. Ugh. I need a, about to ready to get a prop or something. Come on, get in there. There we go. I like Velodynes, but I don't like working on them. Most of the newer ones you just simply send back to them and they send you a repaired module with a warranty. I gotta say, that's one thing I like about Velodyne is they cost a little bit more money, but they stand behind their stuff. You can't say that too much about modern manufacturers. It's like you buy this expensive thing from them and then, oh, it's broken, oh well. We can give you a discount on another one. Why can't you just fix the one I have? Sadly, most companies just import stuff anyways. So what they're selling with their name on it, likely they they didn't make. Okay, so we got one more left to go there. Heat up the lead so it punches through the old solder. Nope, it's going to want to bend instead. Awesome. Now, I know some people say, well, you can just punch through the uh, 
bottom with the lead, right? We can try to do that, but that usually doesn't work too well. These lead holes are so small. Let's see if uh, reaming that out helped. Now I gotta scrape the solder flakes off. So it's not gonna fit in the hole again. Those lead holes are just such a tight fit in there. What a pain. Try not to snap off the edge connector on that board getting this in here. And now that one wants to jam up again. This has not been very fun. Bear with me. Maybe I'll just cut this part out. Yeah, this is taking too much time. I'm going to figure out a way to get this one in here, and then we'll cut to the next one. All right, so we finally got that Nightmarish capacitor pulled through. So let's go ahead and solder these up. Then we'll work on the, the other guys, which will hopefully be a lot easier. A hot iron is crucial here, about 45, 50 watts so that the solder will flow quickly to the other side without uh, killing the component you just inserted. All right, those are in. Let's go ahead and cut our leads off. It's almost real time, although the uh, fix for the final capacitor only took me about another minute or two, so it wasn't too much time lost there. Those are at least the hard ones. All right. So the next thing we'll shoot for are these 33 microfarads here. These ones seem a little bit easier to get in here. There's one. And there's the other. That was easy. And let's go ahead and solder them up. The holes on these boards are also much bigger. So they, uh, there's less probability that the component's going to get hung up in the lead holes. And then finally, we've got the uh, the two down here, which are the 4.7s. The consistency between the boards, I'll say, is not consistent at all. Some of these boards are have uh, much different manufacturing. But yet they're all stamped with Velodyne, so I wonder if Velodyne's actually making them or if somebody else did. Oh, sorry guys, can't see that. Yep, flying capacitor. Let's bend the lead a little bit so we can get it in there easier. There we go. We'll get this in here and then we'll solder these up. And we'll see if that actually fixes the low frequency oscillation problem. I'm hoping it does. But won't know until you try, do it, will you? 
Okay. Uh, this one's going to be stubborn. Not really helping that the leads are getting in the way. But... All right, so those are in. Let's solder those up, and then we'll pop this thing back in after cleaning the controls. Always clean the controls when you've got these things apart because they're almost always noisy. Come on. All right, we've got those in. Let's cut the leads. <laughs> All right. Take a quick look here and make sure that we don't have anything uh, bridging, anything weird. Looks good. All right, let's get some uh, keg deoxit and clean out the controls. And then we'll plug it in and see where we're at. I've got to say, this new uh, nozzle thing that they've got on here, I mean, it's easy to hold like this, but there's very little spray control. I, I like the old adjustable nozzle better. That, and you've got in a, a more difficult ability to attach a, an extension on here. For some reason, even if I abrade it and use uh, glue, my heat shrink tube extension doesn't work very well. So, uh, but hey keg wanted to change something so be it so I'm just gonna spray the contact cleaner in and work these back and forth a bunch okay this was set at about 85 this was we'll just put that at minimum all right She's got the new caps in, we've got the pots cleaned, let's uh, put it back in and see what happens. Alright, so we got this thing back in here, let's hook it up and see if it works. Alright, so here it is, the big moment. I've got a signal generator hooked up, everything's secure, I'm going to reach over and flip the power switch and we're going to see if it works. So, all right, here we go. Didn't get much of anything. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's not oscillating. That's good. Other than the signal I put in it. See, I can crank it up, and you can see it hit its limiter. It doesn't clip and it doesn't distort, it just maxes out. That's the servo doing its job, even if we go down way deep here. Ah, we got a little bit of bottom there. But before, this thing would just go like this, wider and wider, until it would smash the back of the cabinet. So good, it's fixed. The last one I did, I was not so lucky. So, if the accelerometer is good, you can replace the capacitors in the feedback circuit 
and in the regulated supply and that will well sometimes fix it let's uh, just plug a source into it really quick actual music music and let's see if that does us any good Cool. All right, so uh, that takes care of it. So if you've got an old Velodyne F1200B that's got the horrible low frequency oscillation problem, uh, give replacing the capacitors a try. If you're lucky, it will fix it. If not, the accelerometer is bad and you're just kind of screwed. Or it could be one of the chips in the IC, uh, the, one of the ICs in the feedback circuit is bad, but that's very rare. So anyways, hope this video is helpful to you uh, old Velodyne owners. Uh, more stuff to come soon.